Well, good morning. It's a joy to be with you all this morning. Um, your pastor and I actually go back 17 years. Um, we, we met in seminary. Um, we, we started seminary at the same time and, uh, and became friends. And we kind of went our own ways for a while because he was from the Virginia Conference and I'm from our conference. And then he um, found his way over to us. So I got to connect with him again. And uh, so it's a joy for me to, to be here among his flock, um, to worship with you and to, and to share the word with you this morning. Um, in case you want to know a little bit more about me, I'm uh, the guide for the Annapolis Southern Region, which includes um, this area, and I, I resource pastors and, and congregations um, to help them figure out what that next step is for them, that, that God has for them. And I'm, I'm married, um, have three kids who are uh, worshiping at uh, the church I call my charge in, in uh, Arnold, just north of Annapolis. So, um, so anyway, it's, it's great to be with you, and um, I want to begin by by making an observation that uh, I, I was thinking about this week, that we live in a world in which we constantly interact with what we call the service industry. You know, it's, these are the people who perform services for us that we pay them to do. And if you think about how many different people we pay to do things for us, for example, this encompasses uh, teenage kids at the McDonald's fulfilling our order, all the way up to highly paid attorneys who service our legal uh, interests. So anytime we pay somebody to do something for us or to give us some kind of service, we're engaging people in the service industry. And so because of that, we've gotten very used to evaluating how well people serve us, haven't we? I mean, we know bad service when we've gotten it, and we, and we say things, you know? Or we know if we've been really well served, too. So, give an example of that. I once had a, had a dentist. How many of y'all like going to the dentist? Didn't think so. Okay. But he was more than just a dentist. He was a very good one. And because I would sit down in his chair, and you know how nervous you are when you sit down in the dentist chair, and he'd shake my hand, and he'd take a little bit of time to, to talk to me, and, and then as his, he was doing his work, he was just excellent and gentle, and, and the great thing was, while I was sitting in his chair wondering what next he was going to do, you know, he would talk, just keep talking conversationally, and, uh, or he would talk to somebody who was helping him, and include me in the conversation as much as I could, you know, with stuff in my mouth, but, um, and then... His office staff were just wonderful, so kind and accommodating. And then whenever I got work done that he did, he would call me that night from his cell phone to check up on me to ask how I was doing. And then he gave, and he gave me his number and he said, look, if you have any complications over the next couple of days, you feel free to call me. Well, I got to the point that I actually looked forward to going to the dentist. I mean, imagine that, you know? But... Out of that, though, I want you to see that there's this difference between okay, which we encounter a lot of, and really good, isn't there? We encounter a lot of okay in our world, but there's a difference between that and really good. So, when we say, to turn the page a little bit, that when Jesus is our good shepherd, we have to ask the question, what is it that makes him really good? Because Jesus as the good shepherd is such a familiar image to many of us. It, it almost borders on being too familiar that the image just gets kind of lost on us of Jesus as the good shepherd. Also, it doesn't really help that the image of shepherding sheep might get lost on us too. Do we have any sheep shepherds here? Didn't think so. So, but... For the people for whom the scriptures were written, the people of Israel, from Abraham and on, they were primarily livestock herders. And so to say this, you know, I'm sure most of us are here or not, and so those images of shepherding might get lost on us. But this morning, I want to take a closer look at Psalm 23, the first scripture that was read. It's a very, very familiar one uh, to all of us. I can't think of a uh, a funeral I've conducted in which it wasn't read or requested to be read. Because when Jesus spoke of himself in the Gospel of John as the Good Shepherd in John 10, surely 
he had this scripture, Psalm 23, in his mind. And so to understand Jesus' shepherding role in our lives, I want us to be able to take a look at it through the lens of Psalm 23 and the images that the psalmist gives us to describe the work of the Lord, our shepherd. And in, I was, it was, it's a challenge because we know Psalm 23 so well, but I wanted to look at it with fresh eyes. And as I did, I found Jesus, the good shepherd, in Psalm 23 in three ways. Three ways. He is the shepherd that goes ahead of us. He is the shepherd who walks beside us. And he is the shepherd who walks behind us. And we see that progression in Psalm 23. So one of the, as we think about Jesus going ahead of us, one of the iconic images of the shepherd is the shepherd out in, flood, in front of the flock leading them. I mean, how many times we've seen pictures or images of Jesus uh, or a shepherd with a staff, you know, out in front with a, a herd of sheep, you know, behind him or her. And, and so to try to understand this, again, I'm not a sheep herder either. I, I found some, some uh, videos on YouTube to get a sense of exactly what a sheep shepherd does, what a shepherd does. And one of the first things I learned is that sheep definitely need a shepherd for two reasons. The shepherd is there to help them so that none of them wander off because I was amazed that as I was watching the shepherd, you know, shepherd these sheep, inevitably there would be a couple sheep to start to, to wander off from the rest of the group. And so the shepherd would be there to, to make sure that the, the herd stayed together. And then also the, the other important job of the shepherd as he leads the sheep from out front is to show them where they need to go for the things they need, for food and for water and for protection. And that's exactly what the psalmist describes the Lord doing for us in the first part of Psalm 23. The shepherd brings us to places, those green pastures, makes us lie down but in the green pastures and leads us besides those still waters to the places that are the most life-giving. And that's where Jesus leads us. Jesus said in John 10:10, 10, 10, on chapter 10, verse 10, I have come that they, that we, may have life, abundant life. And that's what Jesus promises us is life, not just eternal life in the by and by, but life beginning right here, right now, abundant, full, rich. That's what Jesus is trying to lead us to. And so the reality is following Jesus leads us into a life that is life-giving as he shows us the best places to go, what the Psalm 23 calls the paths of righteousness. He leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, the psalm says. And the way of Jesus, the path of righteousness, is unconditional love for God and for one another. He shows us, Jesus shows us, how to love just like he loves. That is his path of righteousness for us. So that's the shepherd leading out in front. But also, as I was uh, watching those videos of, of shepherds, I noticed that they didn't just stay in front of the sheep. They were actually all over the place. They were constantly moving around the flock to keep them together, to keep them moving in the right direction. And so in Psalm 23, we see that the Lord, our shepherd, moves from being in front of the sheep to at times walking beside them as well. And in Psalm 23, the good shepherd moves to be beside his sheep when they are in trouble. The psalmist describes walking through the darkest valley or traditionally the valley of the shadow of death. It's one of the most stark images in Psalm 23. And I don't think that the psalmist was talking about just strictly death. The darkest valley that the psalmist talks about is, symbolizes any time that we are faced with adversity or with pain, with confusion, in those what we call the dark nights of the soul. Those times in which it just seems like everything is, 
Everything that we know it seems to be far away from us, and we're in this time of pain, confusion, depression. I've been there. I'm sure some of you have, too. The darkest valley. And what's most beautiful to note is where the Good Shepherd is when we're in that dark valley. He's not ahead of us. He's beside us. When we walk through that dark, painful, uncertain times and places, the psalm says, I don't have to fear. Why? Because, what does it say? You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me, they comfort me. The beautiful thing is, is that we do not need to harbor anxiety and dread because the Lord is with us. And he is not only with us during those times of darkness, but he comes armed with his rod and with his staff, the psalm says. The rod is there to protect us from evil. The staff is there to lead us forward. And so it's a beautiful thing to know that, especially when we're going through dark times, that we do not go with him alone. He is right there with us to protect us, to walk with us with this rod and with the staff. And that's especially important to know, especially during those times when it doesn't seem like he's there at all. And I know some of us have felt that too. Now, does this mean that we will be kept from all harm or pain? No. We know that's not the case. But we can be sure that even the worst of evil will not do us in at all because Jesus, our good shepherd, is right there beside us through every single inch of that darkest valley that we go through. Amen? In fact, the psalm goes on to say that the shepherd's love and protection is so great that we can face our enemies and our adversaries not with hate and with violence, but we can face our enemies and our adversaries with peace and an invitation to sh even share with us. The good shepherd, the psalm says, sets a table before us in the presence of our enemies. That's the psalmist's way of saying that a table, a shared meal, symbolizes winning over evil with love and with graciousness. And God gives us the strength to do that. It, it doesn't take much strength, it doesn't take much courage to fight back evil and, and with adversaries with hate and with violence. That's what people do all the time. That's just our knee-jerk reaction to protect ourselves. But what the Good Shepherd allows us to do is because he's with us, we can face our adversaries, we can face those against us, not with hate and with violence, but with love and with graciousness. They won't know what to do with that. <laughs> but that's what the Good Shepherd is right there beside us to do. And then we also see that the Good Shepherd is not only in front of us, leading us to where we need to go, and he's beside us when we're in times of trouble, but we also see that the Good Shepherd is behind us as well. Verse 6 says, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. The better way to understand the Hebrew word for follow is to translate it actually as pursue. So listen to it again. Surely your goodness and love will pursue me all the days of my life. Pursue, that means behind, chasing after us. God's love, God's mercy, God's faithfulness, chasing after us our whole lives. And so we can see that no matter where we go, no matter where we're walking, whether we're in the way of Christ or whether we've gotten lost, his faithful love will always keep pursuing us every single day of our lives. This reminds me of Jesus' parable of the lost sheep, which is one of my favorite parables of his, where it describes the shepherd who had 100 sheep, and 99 of them were found, but there was one who was lost. And the shepherd went and pursued this lost sheep and did not stop until the sheep was found, carried the sheep back to the other 99, and threw up a great celebration because this lost sheep was fine and found. And Jesus said that there will be just as much rejoicing in heaven for the one sinner who repents over the 99 who have already have. 
All that to say that God never gives up, Jesus never gives up on any of us or anyone who we know because we see in the psalm that his love and his faithfulness pursue us from behind all the days of our lives. Jesus never stops pursuing us. His faithful love will never give up on us. Now, to put all this together, we see the Lord our shepherd who goes before us to lead us to abundant life, goes beside us to protect us in our times of trouble, and goes behind us to pursue us always with his love and faithfulness. But so far, we haven't yet seen exactly what makes Jesus, our shepherd, the good shepherd. Remember, I was talking at the beginning of the sermon about uh, things that are okay, good enough, and really good. What I've described so far is the work of an adequate shepherd. This is what a shepherd is asked to do. But what is it that makes Jesus our good shepherd? What makes him really good? And we see it right there in, in John's Gospel, the last scripture that was read, specifically verse 11, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And I want to say that again because I don't want those words to get lost on you. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The sign of an excellent leader is that the excellent leader is one who always thinks first of the welfare and the well-being of the one she leads. And if necessary, a good leader will always take the brunt of any ad adversity for the sake of those he leads. I love watching movies and reading stories about a leader who makes sure that everyone under his command, everyone that he's been set to care for, are safe and secure before he secures in his own safety. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us. Jesus saw how we, as the human race, are held hostage by evil and by sin and by death. And, and you don't really need to uh, think too deeply about that. All you have to do is, is uh, turn on the news or open the newspaper and you can see a humanity held hostage by evil and sin and death. And so Jesus, our good shepherd, wasn't content just to lead us. He laid down his life for us on the cross. Why? To take the brunt of the scourge of evil and sin and death upon himself. So therefore, we, the sheep, no longer live under the guilt and the shame of sin. We, the sheep, are no longer needing to be held hostage by evil. Evil will not prevail over us, nor do we have to succumb to evil. Jesus, our good shepherd, laid down his life for us that we would be free. Jesus laid down his life for us that we would be cleansed. The good shepherd laid his life down for us that we would be empowered by the Holy Spirit to live abundantly and eternally, now and always. That is what makes Jesus the good shepherd. Amen? Amen. So as a way of closing my message, I want to give an invitation to you. It's not enough to simply know here, conceptually, that Jesus is the good shepherd. We need to take that long 18-inch ride down to the heart and know it here that Jesus is our good shepherd. And that means, friends, a heart that trusts Jesus, listens to him, and follows him. There are so many voices out in the world clamoring for our attention, and there's so many 
things out there that, that they want us to go here and to go there and to buy this and to do that. And they all claim the same thing. This is going to make you happy. This is going to make you rich. This is going to make you successful, important, powerful, whatever. But those things never, ever, ever live up to their promise, ever. But if we take the time to listen to Jesus and to watch for him and to trust him, as he promises, he leads us to abundant life. He protects us in times of trouble. He pursues us always. And he has already laid down his life for us. So I'd like to close my message with a prayer for, for you and, and for me. That we would indeed trust Jesus, the good shepherd. And to listen for him and to follow him. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, our friend, our Lord, our good shepherd, thank you, Lord, for pursuing us every day of our life. As frustrating as we may be to ourselves and to others and to you sometimes, you never, ever give up on us, ever. You pursue us with your love and your faithfulness. Help us to open ourselves up to you. Lord, when we're in trouble, and some of us may be in trouble now, help us to look over and to see that you're right there with us, your rod and your staff there to protect us and to comfort us. And God, every day help us to look ahead and to follow in the steps of Jesus, who taught us to love as he loved. He taught us to love you, God, with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength, and taught us to love our neighbors, ourselves, even our enemy, who taught us to forgive and to give and to show grace to others, whether they deserve it or not. God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to us, Jesus, help us to keep our eyes on you, to accept you into our lives as our Lord and Savior, and to trust you always, that you would indeed lead us into those green pastures in which you invite us to lie down and to enjoy, that you lead us beside those still flowing waters to refresh our souls day after day. Thank you, Jesus, for being our good shepherd. All this we pray to you in the name of Jesus, our good shepherd, who loved us and who always loves us. Amen.